Welcome to Business Authority Radio, bringing you insights from today's thought leaders, professionals, and influencers with your hosts, Neil Howe and Craig Williams. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and today my special guest is Dr. Jason Bailey. Uh, Dr. Bailey helps everyday people with simple or complex injuries or diseases of the body to be restored with plastic surgery. He does this in an innovative way by bypassing the insurance companies, complex medical middleman and hospital overcharges by presenting patients with affordable, bundled, comprehensive, transparent, uh, transparent surgical pricing for his surgical services. There's a lot of S's in there, Dr. Bailey. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show. Well, Neil, thank you. I, there are. I appreciate you having me, and I look forward to this discussion. Well, I really want to hear a little bit more about your business up front. Uh, what is your business, and who do you help? Well, I'm a plastic surgeon, I'm board certified in that, which means I did specialized training and then underwent the appropriate testing and the Board of Plastic Surgery certified me as one of their own. I've uh, had that title for four years now and I've been practicing medicine for seven. I work in Houston, Texas, and I perform plastic surgery in the broad sense. Plastic surgeons often consider ourselves the last of the true general surgeons, and what that means is we operate on the body from head to toe, and we have a broad scope of what we're trained in, and we find interest in in things that we have uh, ability in and and we enjoy doing, and that leads us to um, operate more often on certain areas of the body and and take care of patients with a more specific scope of problems. Um, I do enjoy the broad aspect of plastic surgery. But one of the most common things plastic surgeons do, and one thing that people are are familiar with, which is an approachable topic, is is breast and breast cancer. And uh, women, one in eight, and we think sometimes in other populations, as many as one in seven, end up having some form of cancer. And there are a bundle of other diagnoses that result in women having some sort of removal of tissue from their breast. So that's a common ailment that I'm asked to assist um, my patients with. Uh, Many times patients are sent to me by general surgeons who have operated and and they're anticipating a woman may need my expertise in reconstructing and reforming her natural form. Or patients sometimes self-refer after they've had remote treatment, even up to 10 years before. At the time they were diagnosed, they were focused on their cancer care and recovery from that. And they may have undergone reconstruction. So I think that that's a good area to start with. Yeah, definitely. I'd like to really get into that. But let's just discuss, um, there, there's different areas of plastic surgery. Uh, there's the functional surgery that it seems like you like to perform, but there's the cosmetic side as well. Do you also do some of that? I do. And I think that any plastic surgeon will tell you that those two things do overlap. You know, certainly we're talking about breast, for example. The breast has a function, which is uh, when someone becomes a mother, they, they feed their child. On a man, you could argue there's not as much function. Um, but if you're operating on someone's nose and their patient breaks to their nose, there's a certain form it takes to fall inside the norms, but also it has a functional component of allowing the air to flow through it, become humidified, and have proper flow and turbulence, but not feel obstructive as a device for breathing. So I think that that comes into play in a lot of things plastic surgeons do. The ultimate surgical functional capacity that we're able to restore is when somebody injures their hand and they may have cut tendons or displaced their bones with fractures and they're unable to move it. And then after surgery and rehabilitation, you can completely restore that function in many cases. So that that does come into play with what we do. And we're always concerned about the kind of final aesthetic outcome once all that function is restored. So there's definitely a balance there, uh, you know, function first, uh, cosmetic second, maybe. So we, you talked about uh, breast cancer being a major issue today. What other kinds of surgeries do you see? Well, 
there are patients that for a variety of reasons suffer injury to their face. It may be from a car wreck, from falling, from freak sports accidents. And a large part of my practice is treating facial trauma. What that means is maybe somebody is just nipped by a dog and they have a small cut on their lip all the way to the patient which was in a motor vehicle accident and had complex fractures of their jaw, their nose, their forehead. And that's an exciting area of medicine that's made a lot of advancements because of 3D imaging, computer software, which has allowed us greater ability to restore what they've injured. So that would be another area that I think is, is kind of moving in, in an exciting direction and something that I have a personal interest in. Mm. Well, let's walk through a couple of these uh, case studies, maybe, if you will. Uh, if, if somebody has breast cancer and they're looking to get them removed, you know, well, who does that and what kind of problems uh, does it cause and how do you help them? Well, I will tell you that it is a complicated discussion and decision for be it woman or even man comes into play in this discussion because there are many get breast cancer. And the decision to remove the cancer as a primary operation versus treating with chemotherapy and radiation, shrinking whatever tumor they may have, and then performing a surgery, be it a local removal or full removal of the breast, is a complex decision that patients, generally speaking, make after they've had the opportunity to talk to a cancer doctor, which is called a medical oncologist or a surgical oncologist, which is the one that actually does the surgery in conjunction with the treatment of the medical oncologist, but also a plastic surgeon. In fact, in some states, such as California, where I did my training, a patient has the right to speak to a plastic surgeon, irregardless of who's paying the bills, be it the government under Medicare or Medicaid program or a private insurer, before they undergo that exonerative removal surgery of their breasts, so they understand all of their options. So a patient may get a diagnosis of a tumor. There are certainly different stages which people have heard about, which are beyond the scope of this discussion. But let's just take the scenario of a patient that decides that for reasons down the road or for treatment of their cancer, they are going to have total removal of one breast for the sake of this discussion. And so at that point, the patients had a discussion with me about different means of reconstructing that breast to try to remake the form. And I would say that the goal would be that it would match their other breast, which will remain untouched surgically, at least from the initial cancer surgery that's removing the diseased breast from the other side. And that's the way we undertake the discussion. First of all, we ask the patient, are you happy with your breast before you even got this diagnosis? And some patients are, and they just want back what they had. Or other patients had some desires for changes, maybe because they've had children, or because they've just all felt like their breasts were too large or too small. And that that's sort of their endpoint goal. And so sometimes we are able to use the cancer to the patient's advantage in the sense that we remove tissue along with the cancer where their breast is reduced to a size which is reasonable to them and the surgery is just simply that it's a simple removal and that we're not adding anything back. More commonly, a patient is missing tissue on the side that is removed and you have to rebuild a breast. There's various ways to do that. Of course, the public is all aware of silicon implants or saline implants and that's been used. Well, and they were actually developed in Houston from where I'm speaking to you about 60 years ago, and there's been sort of changes in the types of implants that are made, but those have remained a consistent way to remake a woman's breast. And sort of mimics the natural tissue, but I think we all understand that it's, it's not native breast tissue, so it feels different and often looks a little different than what it would look like if it was remade with their own tissue. More recently, some innovators in our field have figured out ways to remove tissue with little arteries and veins and use a microscope and hook that tissue up to the area of the breast where there's blood vessels and sort of steal from Peter to pay Paul, most common of which being lower abdominal tissue, where that sort of soft, supple, let's call it slightly fatty tissue of 
lower abdomen below your belly button is put onto your chest and it's shaped by the surgeon and made into a form which mimics a normal breast. And there's been some spectacular examples of this that breached the main press. There was, for example, an identical twin sister that was very thin and she got breast cancer and her sister donated her tummy top fat to her to remake this breast. So it was a, it was a nice example that reached mainstream media um, that sort of, I think, illustrates kind of where we've gone in the last 25 years of being able to do that from a technical standpoint. And then there's some newer techniques which are out there. Liposuction, which has been around, and we credit our obstetricians for actually inventing this technique, but certainly plastic surgeons have taken that and ran with it. And there's a whole field and interest now coming out for transferring this liposuction fat to different areas of the body, be it aesthetic augmentation of the breast or actually reforming the entire breast after removal or mastectomy into a new breast by simply using liposuction fat and injection. And that's something that I have particular expertise in and interest because I feel like it's an alternative for women who want to remake a natural feeling and sensate breast. And I think that that's what is key is that when we go back to our initial discussion about function, part of the function of the breast is not only for breastfeeding, but also has some sensory function. It has, you know, a certain ability to make women feel whole, feminine, and part of that is the ability of them to feel their areola and their nipple. And unfortunately, some of the reconstructive techniques, particularly using silicon implants or tissue from the lower abdomen blocks the regrowth of these nerves from deep to superficial to that area where the nipple is. And so women were sometimes reconstructed with a beautiful mimicry of the other breast from their abdominal tissue will be left with a completely numb nipple and breast. And the classic example is the woman that comes in with a burn on her chest because she was using a heating pad and didn't realize that it was burning her because she has simply no sensation. So alternatively, when you use transfer of fat from other areas of the body, it doesn't allow a barrier to form. So those nerves can at least regrow in a protective sense and some sensation can be regained, which I think is one aspect of that technique, which I think is exciting. Another yeah, it, it's, uh, yes, ama it's amazing what uh, can be done with plastic surgery these days you know the advances it seems in the last five ten years have really you know made things you know from a pure surgical standpoint to a less invasive standpoint it really is uh, exciting to see where this is going in the future i didn't mean to cut you off there so continue but neil i think you brought up a pertinent point which is the invasive nature of surgery because Surgeons certainly know that it is a trauma to the body to have surgery. It's a controlled trauma, but it's a trauma nonetheless. And when I have patients in 2017, now 2018, that are undergoing breast reconstruction, many of them are working. And I take into account what reconstructions are offered to them because the question many times they have is how much time off work am I going to have? And that's what's also exciting about using a patient's own fat through fat transfer is that that tissue that you're transferring in liposuction, relatively speaking, is a small amount of trauma to the patient's body. People have heard about liposuction when they have maybe extra tissue on their legs or their thighs and they're trying to contour so they look better in clothing or have a better form. But the amount of tissue you remove to remake a breast through this technique is relatively speaking small. So we're talking about a surgery where a patient can undergo as an outpatient and after a few days of recovery, be back at work rather than these other techniques, which also work well, but they do require a longer rehabilitation period of about six to eight weeks of, of time off of work. So that's one thing that I do bring up to patients when we're going over different options for them. 
Well, let's talk about the outcome of these kinds of surgeries. Tell me what it does for the patient, just both physically and mentally. Well, look, Neil, when you're speaking about breast, or even a better example is somebody who may have an injury to their face, and certainly it's human nature to feel subconscious about any alteration in your form. People ask you about it, or they're embarrassed to ask you about what happened, and patients are very aware of it. So when they're able to put themselves in a position where they can undergo the treatment, be it surgical or unsurgical, and you can erase that deviation from the normal, where the patient feels like, well, they may have a small scar, or they may have an irregularity, but they don't look deformed. Nothing makes a patient happier, and frankly, Myself as a doctor, nothing makes me happier for the patient and feel like we've gotten a win for them. Because ultimately, that's what we do. We res restore the shape and form of the patient and hopefully also good functional outcome uh, to, to sort of allow them to get back into life and not sort of dwell on whatever situation happened, be it trauma or cancer that created that problem in the first place. Mm. Yeah, it definitely gives them that confidence back to, you know, get back to life as, as they were before. Let's talk a little bit about the facial issues that you were, are, uh, that you see a, a lot in your office. Uh, tell me some of the problems that people come in with. Is it from accidents, car accidents, or uh, just like you said, freak sports accidents? <laughs> How do people get their face smashed? Well, there's a wide variety of reasons why people have sort of derangements of their facial skeleton. But what's really exciting these days is these new technology of three-dimensional printing. We now have the ability to take a three-dimensional CT scan of your face and customize reconstructive implants, be them made out of silicon, or products which are similar to bone, and then implant them in the areas where you're missing bone or indentations or traumatic fractures which are unable to be reduced and put back in place. And that is a very exciting field because that's only become possible in the past few years. So problems which were overwhelmingly complex surgically, which will require sometimes even days of surgery, or stage procedures, these days can be sometimes performed with proper planning, with imaging, and then having these specific implants which are custom made to the patient's face, ready, and then they're implanted during surgery in a relatively non-complex fashion. The planning, of course, has to be undertaken in the proper manner, and it does require back and forth with companies that specialize in creating these, and the surgeon has to have a plan as far as what approach they're going to use to be able to implant this material. It's really revolutionized the field. And I think it's nice because it's allowed surgeons who may not do this type of surgery every day to be able to approach some of these more complex problems so patients have more access to care. Yeah, it really does seem complex when you're dealing with the face and so many small structures that uh, you know, this new technology is really helping out. Uh, let's talk about some of the misconceptions uh, about the, in, the industry. Uh, why do you think plastic surgeons are you know, maybe the last to be thought of as the person to go to when you have an accident? Well, unfortunately, I think it's a fault of our own because our specialty was formed during the First and Second World War. Essentially, in the trench warfare, people were being shot, their faces were severely deformed in the type of warfare which was being done back then. And plastic surgery sort of became its own during that time. There were some innovators that worked in that field. And the majority of plastic surgeons developed a skill set and really, it was a mindset of tenacity and continuing to be involved in the patient's surgical care until they were happy 
and had a functional, reasonable outcome. And that was the foundation of the specialty. Actually, the only two surgeons to ever win the Nobel Prize were both, interestingly enough, plastic surgeons. Mm -hmm. And so we have a strong foundation in reconstructive medicine and helping surgeons with problems that may have reached the limits of their ability. So we like to think of ourselves as the surgeon's surgeon, and often our patients are referred to us by other surgeons which need assistance because things have become overwhelmingly complex, be it through microsurgical techniques or other more advanced techniques as we were speaking about using three-dimensional implants or materials. But what then happened is we took that skill set and we realized that aesthetic medicine is also a very complex task because you have a patient who's healthy, who is looking for changes, sometimes looking younger or enhancing often areas of their body which they feel are deficient or they've always wanted to be more proportional. And so we took that skill set and we applied it towards aesthetic medicine. And I think that plastic surgeons, because of their training and background and experience with more complex problems, were very good at it. And they sort of took the ball and ran with it. And slowly but surely, they sort of eroded their footprint with the hospitals and immigrated out to clinics and began offering these services. Superimposed on that aesthetic side of medicine was hospitals and insurance providers who were becoming more and more consolidated. More physicians were being employed, not because they wanted to be, but because they could not handle the complexities of the economic reality of running a practice. And the last bastion of private practice has now become specialties which can apply fee for service model and cosmetic medicine, aesthetic surgery is certainly one of those. So you have now a situation where plastic surgeon is plastic surgery has popularized itself with aesthetic medicine because that's how they make a living in most cases. But I think certainly everyone within my field, people that are board certified and maintain that, still have that skill set. Although they may not advertise it, I think many of us maintain a strong focus on the broad aspect of our field, be it aesthetic or reconstructive. And I think some barriers to patients coming to our specialty is that they perceive what we do as overtly expensive, non approachable, and they think, well, the other specialist of which may be more numerous in number, which, well, they'll be just as good at fixing this, or maybe I should go to them first. So I always appreciate the calls I get from a friend or a colleague that says they've requested a plastic surgeon because they feel like you're the best at doing whatever surgery or intervention they may need. As small as it may be, I, of course, appreciate patients' appreciation and understanding for our skill set. So I think that that's a barrier is that patients perceive our specialty as only doing aesthetics or very highly complex things. And some of the more run-of-the-mill type operations, we are actually happy to be involved with. So you, you also have a program that helps people with either insurance or you know, finding a way to pay f- for the procedure if they think that they, it might not be available to them. Explain what it is that you do in your office. Well, I feel strongly that the relationship between the patient and the physician has to do with their medical care, but also doctors need to do financial responsibility for what they're charging the patient. When they insert middlemen between themselves and the patient, I think that that's when that relationship gets eroded. Physicians certainly need to be compensated for what they do. But if they make that relationship directly with the patient, universally, it's a less expensive interaction for that patient. No one's taking a cut. So what we do in our office is we publish exactly to the dime of what it costs to get procedures done, the entire procedure. I employ the anesthesiologist that treats the patient. All the equipment, materials, the facility where it's done at is all under my control. And so the patient knows exactly what things are going to cost before they step into that relationship for the care. I can tell you that there is no patient that has insurance or even a 
federally funded programs such as Medicare or Medicaid that can walk into a hospital and say, well, I need my gallbladder out. What's this going to cost me? You cannot get an answer until that care is rendered and the bills are issued. So I think it's rather unique and I think it's a growing trend within medicine as a whole to be transparent about what things cost up front and to make it less complex for the patient and bundle all those charges in the one fee so patients know where they stand and what things are going to cost when they're done with their care. So there's no surprises when they're trying to recover. Right. There's nothing like getting the bill in the mail and not knowing what it's going to be for, you know? Oh, no uh, doubt. We've and it's, been... uh, it's usually a really big surprise. Sure. It's happened to everybody. And well, it's just sort of a dirty secret out there that if a patient has insurance and the doctor is contracted with their insurance company, the doctor can't cut them a deal. Even if it's their cousin, it's against the contract they made with the insurance company. So as a practice, my only contracts are with the patients. And that way I have complete control to do, offer discounts, offer charity care as I see fit, help patients with high deductible plans, whatever it may be, I make the decision along with the patient. We don't let anyone else get in the middle of that relationship. And I think that that's, well, not innovative, but how it really just should be. Right. That seems like common sense. That would be the way to go. But, you know, once you get the middleman in there and they're, they're making money, they don't want to get out. So I definitely applaud you for, for doing that and dealing uh, straight with the patients. Well, let's uh, get to a, a testimonial or a story maybe of uh, one of the patients that you've dealt with in your career. Give me a uh, bit of a breakdown of how they came to you, how they came in, what you were able to do for them, and how, what was the outcome? How did it change your life? Well, I'd love to do that. So there's a patient that um, was followed for 30 years by a neurosurgeon, very well known in the field, and she had a very complex problem where her veins and arteries were intermingled and tangled Patients that have these malformations, which are also known as atrial venous malformations, can be very complex to remove. Therefore, many times they're just observed, treat their blood pressure. And unfortunately for this patient, one day she had a bleed, which is also known as a stroke in her brain. And she had to have emergency surgery to remove the bone, which makes up her skull, and to drain that blood to treat her stroke. Unfortunately, following that surgery, when the bone was put back on her skull, she got a post-surgical infection, and the bone had to be removed from her skull, and she was left with a defect, sort of a contour area of her head, which was indented. She had no protection for her brain. And number one, patient had to wear a helmet, which was cumbersome because a little bump in the head could, could hit the area where she didn't have protected brain. And also, it was aesthetically displeasing. Now, 15 years ago, we would have had to take from the patient her ribs and recreate bone by forming those ribs into a curve that assimilates her skull. But as I was telling you, we simply obtained a very high-resolution CT scan of this patient. We had a company form the perfect size implant to recreate her skull, which was made out of a type of plastic, which is very similar to bone. And in a relatively simple way, we were able to restore this patient's skull. And she was able to go on living her life with her husband, being active. And it was very gratifying because certainly you take a picture of this patient, you look at the before and after, and, and you understand that there's been a big change in what she looks like. And it's helped her put this stroke behind her, get back to her life. But also, if you have my background and have performed the type of surgery that used to be done by taking her own bone and reforming it, as opposed to using these newer technologies, you just understand that, well, our field has learned a lot. We've been able to rely on technology, and I think there's still exciting things to come. And that's what makes it interesting to, 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 to do what we do as physicians and, and certainly plastic surgeons get to take advantage of that. Yeah, you know, I really like doing interviews with people like yourself, Dr. Bailey, who make a tremendous difference in people's lives. Uh, you know, 
I'm sure you get many, many thanks from them for your expertise in what you do. Um, lastly, is there anything else that we, we have covered uh, quite a lot of uh, stuff today, a very interesting conversation. Is there anything else you would like to leave our audience with before we go? Well, I've appreciated our conversation. I appreciate the audience that's listened. And I would just task everybody that when they have a physician and they're treating them for whatever problem it may be, is to realize they're dealing with a human individual. And I think that many physicians are overwhelmed by trying to explain the complexities of what we're doing to the patient in detail. But I always enjoy when I'm able to speak openly with patients and have a general conversation and spend a little bit of extra time socializing with my patient. And I feel that connects us on a social level. And I would encourage people to do that with their physicians. I always enjoy when patients ask me, Dr. Bailey, you have any children? What do you like doing? I don't mind spending the extra time telling them about myself or asking them what makes them happy. And then we get on to the medical portion of what's going on for that visit. So I would just encourage people to personalize their visits with their physicians, enjoy interacting with each other, and sort of grow that trust from that relationship because it works both ways. And I think maybe they won't mind waiting as long as they have to wait to see that person <laughs> because as conversations can run a little long because ultimately they'll be able to share that that same time with the physician themselves. So I thank you, Neil, for your time and your interview and, and of course your audience. Well, I've really appreciated that as well, and I always learn something new. Uh, tell me, Dr. Bailey, you are in the Houston area. What is the best way for people to get in touch with you and your office? Definitely. I'm in Houston, Texas, centrally located. We have five separate offices, and I have a group of physicians that work with me. I can be looked up on the web. My name is Jason R. Bailey, MD. You can look me up. In our surgery center, where we do the bundled pricing in a transparent fashion, is found under Lone Star Surgery CTR.com. So, a simple internet search will find me. And I look forward to meeting your listeners if they have need of my services. Great. Well, I appreciate you again. Thank you very much for being my guest on Business Authority Radio today. I appreciate you. Thank you, Neil. And to our listening audience, if you like what you hear, hit that like button and share, and we'll see you next time on the show. You've been listening to Business Authority Radio with Neil Howe and Greg Williams. To learn more about the resources mentioned in today's show or to listen to past episodes, visit businessauthorityradio.com.